lullaby just for you What becomes of all the little boys Who never come there They lined up all around the block On the nickel over there You better bring a bucket On June 28, 1979, Dr. Nathan Sack of Columbus, Ohio, a well-known surgeon and his wife, had come to Atlanta for the annual convention of the Association of Nuclear Medicine. They were to be part of Atlanta's 131st homicide of 1979. Give me your handbag. <laughs> Hurry up. Dr. Sack's murder was on the front page of the Atlanta daily newspapers and prominent in newspapers all over the country. But a short time later, a crime happened that barely was mentioned in one of Atlanta's newspapers. In all likelihood, the boy was already dead when he was brought to this spot. He was 14 years old. The second boy was last seen on his way to a skating rink. He, too, was 14 years old. This was the beginning of a case that was to be one of the most baffling in the crime annals of the United States. And before the ordeal had ended, a city would go crazy. And no one who touched the case in any way would ever be the same again. The Atlanta child murders had begun. Do you realize the increase in homicides this year? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't, but I'm quite sure you do. We've had 231 homicides. A 61% increase over 1978. I hope you realize that when you print stories like that, how much you hurt Atlanta. One of our main sources of revenue is the convention trade. The city is 66% black, and we are going to have a proportionate number of black officers, whether you like it or not. Help! Somebody got it! Somebody help! Would you like to play? Well, I don't have any money. Well, I'll take you. Gee, thanks, sir. Another boy was found. His name was Leroy Millard James. He was 14. How long has he been gone? He left here about 4 or 30. All right, I'll go look for him. Don't worry. He just went to do an errand, and he disappeared. And somebody must know something. A young boy just doesn't drop off the face of the earth. Hard. Oh, you turn that up, please? You have a great deal of Atlanta out there. They want to know your feelings. Thank you. I can't help wondering if they're working as hard as they would if it were a white child from a middle-class background. Would there have been a better chance of saving him? If they'd done something right away. I don't know. This is a place where black babies are hunted down and killed. Like animals. Thank <laughs> you. 
There are kids being murdered all over the streets of Atlanta. But they don't matter because the department doesn't make any points if it solves their murders, does it? One more word like that, Mike, and I'm going to ask you for your badge. Jake. Go ask him back. I'd rather turn him on badge. Jake, somebody's got to stop these crimes against children. Or there's no telling where it will end. And what are you saying to the police force? I am advising them, I am pleading with them to concentrate their efforts on this geographic pattern and to put stakeouts here, 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 and here in order to help prevent the next murder. It was the morning of Latonia Wilson's seventh birthday. As unbelievable as it may seem, somebody actually removed the window pane closest to the lock, reached through, opened the lock, then opened the door and stepped in. That person picked her out of her bed where she was sleeping next to her sister, then walked past her brother who was sleeping in the next bed and took her out of the house. You want us to make a statement that there's a Jack the Ripper killing the poor black children of Atlanta? But well, I don't believe that. We got ourselves a black mayor. We got ourselves a black commissioner of public safety. Black councilmen. We got everything black from top to bottom. We got everything. But protection for our black children. If you want to kill off a race, the first thing you must do is kill the seed. Right. Now, the whole thing here in Atlanta is the first step in a plan toward genocide. No, no. no. They didn't my baby. They didn't my baby. Papa did disappear. It's a green carpet fiber. It's very unusual because the cross-section of the fiber shows a trilobular design with one short leg. Trilobular. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll still settle for fingerprints, motive, old-fashioned things like that. What do you want to bet when we find the murderer? He's got a green carpet in his house. The eight-year-old boy has been identified by dental records as Christopher Richardson, son of Selena <laughs> Cobb, who lives at 3624. I'm so Luther sorry, Miss Cobb. Could you tell us how you feel? Get out! Get out! You don't have no more heart than the contraption you brought in here. Now when I find him out, I'm just trying to show you. Get out! Get out of my house! Come on, get out! Get out of here! Help! 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 By mid-March, the pattern of deaths changed again. Bodies were being dumped into the river. The body was clad in red bathing-type shorts. Could have been drowning. But I think we have to mark this uh, mechanism unknown. What am I charged with, man? You're a suspect in the case of the missing and murdered children, Chip. You guys are so desperate for a suspect that it's affecting your faculties. And if I wasn't a veteran of 18 years on the police force, I'd be scared as hell right now. Because I know how easily a case can be made to work if there's a need for it. Look, I'm just warning you, Chip. You just stay out of our way. Get on out the case. We had staked out bridges in DeKalb, Fulton, and Cobb counties. I heard a splash. A loud splash. Is there a car on the bridge? I can't see it from where I'm at. That splash was to change the course of the Atlanta murders and perhaps American jurisprudence forever. Let's see your identification. Wayne Williams. That's right. Did you throw a body into the river? Are you crazy? Would you get out of the car, please? Come on. Come on. Get out. Yes, what is it? Come on. Just step back here, will you, please? Here. Would you move back there? Had we come to the end of what we were looking for for two years? Was this the man who choked the life out of, shot, bludgeoned, and drowned 28 human beings? Or was it someone caught in the net of hysteria and the need to bring an end to Atlanta's nightmare? You heard a splash. Now, could it have been a beaver? There are a lot of beavers around here. They splash their tails in the water. It could sound like a body. I know the difference between a beaver splashing its tail and the sound of a body. You do? How? Well, I used to be a lifeguard. 
This little incident on the bridge here is going to be the talk of the town, the talk of the country. I just hope we're not starting an avalanche of something we can't stop based on a splash. Somebody throwing a body off a bridge that nobody has seen, and the murderer getting back into a station wagon that nobody saw stop. <laughs> Wayne! I have a warrant for your arrest. Mr. Slayton, just eight days ago, you said you had insufficient evidence to arrest Wayne Williams. I did. What made you change your mind? I finally found uh, I couldn't corroborate Williams' story that uh, he had crossed the bridge at 3 in the morning to visit a woman who he was going to interview for a musical audition. But now, in your own words, you said you might have a, a good case for lying, but not for murder. Yes, sir. What yes, sir. about now? Now, I've gone over the fiber evidence with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and Larry Peterson. And I found it's much more substantial than uh, uh, I had believed. And there's something else. Uh, uh, there's a great possibility if we don't move on this, Williams may leave the country. Mr. Slayton, I hate to ask this question. I think you're one of the finest officials this state's ever had. But there are persistent reports that pressure to prosecute Wayne Williams was brought on you at a meeting at the Capitol. I've been in office for eight years. If I had visited the governor's mansion, there would not have been any such pressure uh, that I would have recognized. There were no threats. There were no uh, ultimatums, no deadlines. All right, sir. Well, well, sir. Al Binder joined the defense for Wayne Williams. He was one of the best criminal lawyers in the South. In the courtroom, he sometimes affected the talk and dress of a hick. But Al Binder is no hick. I want you to join a defense team in an advisory capacity. I understand you know more about the Atlanta murder than anybody else. Well, what are you paying? Nothing. <clears throat> That's an attractive offer. Well, what the hell do you think I'm getting? I can imagine. The one thing that makes it almost irresistible is what the expression on the face of the Atlanta police force might be if they discover that Dettlinger is part of the Wayne Williams defense team. <laughs> Thank you. I have a problem, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure Wayne Williams is innocent. I could be a dangerous man to have around. I mean, while I'm investigating the case, I could come up with evidence that says he's guilty. Chance I'll take. May I ask why you're taking the case? Mm, well, I'm a strange specimen. Not only am I a Mississippi Jew, but I've become accepted by the good old boys as one of their own. Things are going too smoothly for me at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm accepted, I'm making money. I miss the good old days when the Ku Klux Klan was burning my house and shooting at my car. <laughs> now, you know what Wayne Williams is up against. Federal Bureau of Investigation, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Atlanta Police Force, newspapers. And who has he got to protect him? Me. That isn't enough to make the old adrenaline go and feel alive again. Nothing is. They were indicting him for Jimmy Ray Payne, too? That's what it says. But you and I were at the autopsy. We were there when the medical examiner said death was caused by an undetermined mechanism. The medical examiner's changed their mind. It's been known to happen before. Jake, Jake, wait a minute. I have gone over this child's background almost from the day he was born. I've talked to the kids in his class. I've talked to his friends. I have checked his record. There's no evidence of violence there. What does somebody do? Wake up one morning with no previous record and go out and kill all these people? Then. You know, Slayton, he's one of the few men of the previous administration we can trust. Do you think he would have allowed this boy to be arrested if he knew he could be innocent? Do you think there's a conspiracy? I don't, no, I don't. But this town needs to put these murders behind it if it wants to survive. So it desperately wants to believe that Wayne is guilty. Yeah. I mean, even some very nice people are saying that maybe he's not guilty, but we ought to convict him anyway. 
Ben, it's not our business to decide whether or not he's guilty. It's Slayton's, and it's that jury's, and it's the state court, and the Supreme Court. Keep change. The prosecution and defense teams in the Wayne Williams case interviewed nearly 900 prospective jurors. On January 5th, 1982, they finally agreed on the 12 people that would be acceptable. In the jury were nine women and three men, eight black and four white. The jury foreman was Sandra W. Laney, cable market planner for Western Electric. Diane E. Brennan, clerk for Kelly Services. Edward Derham, policeman from the Detroit area. Vicki Lamber, accounting clerk from Georgia Power. Lonnie Brown, long haul truck driver. Ruby Hid, seamstress. Dorothy Rucker, a worker at Grady Hospital. Walter Brown, Jr., research technician for State Transportation Department. Clarice Jones, manager for Southern Bell. Jolene Willingham, state public health auditor. Julia M. Wing, a retired bank clerk. Gail Thomas Jones, manager for Southern Bell. Will everyone please rise? Court is now in session. The Honorable Clarence Cooper, Judge Presiding. Sitting on the bench was 40-year-old Judge Clarence Cooper. Please be seated. Slayton. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Lewis Slayton, District Attorney for Fulton County. This case is going to be to you like a jigsaw puzzle with a whole lot of pieces fitted in. At the conclusion, there'll be enough pieces so you'll be able to see the big picture. The witnesses which will be presented to you are not willing witnesses. They're reluctant. They're nervous. They know that Mr. Binder here has a reputation for being an expert in cross-examination. And they know that whatever they testify to might be twisted around where it may seem like they're not too smart. But I want you to sit back and enjoy yourselves best you can. We'll try to make it interesting enough for you so that we'll keep you keenly alert throughout the whole trial. And at the conclusion, I believe you'll be satisfied with the result. Thank you. May it please the court. Your Honor, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I was born in Mississippi, and uh, I've been in this town only nine days. And all the folks I met have been very kind and courteous to me. I was in awe last night about this trial. Before I went to sleep, I asked God's blessing on this court, guided its orders on y'all, on myself, to see that justice is done. I uh, want to introduce you to the defendant. Wayne, I want you to stand up and uh, look at the jury. This is Wayne Williams, defendant. Sit down, son. Now, Wayne was born late in life to Faye and Homer who were school teachers in this community for years. They own a modest home, and they lavished all their love, money, and attention on their young son, their only child they had. At approximately 3 a.m. on May 26, 1981, a recruit uh, named Mr. Campbell heard a splash. Officers saw the headlights of Wayne Williams station wagon. They stopped him. Asked him if he threw anything off the bridge. He denied it. Now, the authorities did not detain Wayne. They searched his car and let him go. Two days later, 
The body of an adult black male by the name of Nathaniel Cater, 28 years old, was found in the river. Nathaniel Cater was what was known as a streetwise person. He sold his blood for money. And he sold his body for money. Wayne is also accused of another murder, of a 21-year-old man, Jimmy Ray Payne. Life wasn't too kind for Mr. Payne, either. Payne spent most of his juvenile and adult days in institutions. On two occasions, he attempted suicide. For one month, law enforcement personnel haunted Wayne up and down the streets of Atlanta like a dog. Now, the only thing that Wayne Williams said regarding that indictment, outside of the fact that he wasn't guilty, was that the only thing I've killed is a roach in my cell. I'm going to ask you, you sit in judgment of this man, that you search for the truth. We're going to ask you to apply to the accused the same treatment that you want for yourself. And I thank you, Your Honor. Listen to what they say. I'll know in my heart whether or not he's guilty. Well, it's not so easy to tell always. We may never know. Don't say that. There ain't nothing they can do to save him, even if they got that smart Jewish lawyer from Mississippi. Well, we'll be the judge and jury. He won't serve a life sentence in no jail. It'll be six feet under in a box. Same as the kids he killed. What is your name, sir? My name is Salah Zaki. Dr. Zaki, what is your position? I'm the associate medical examiner for Fulton County. Dr. Zaki, did you perform an autopsy on Jimmy Ray Payne? Yes, I did. What was your conclusion, doctor, as to the cause of death? The cause of death was asphyxia. Thank you. Your way, Mr. Binder. Now, I want to talk to you about your death certificates. You signed this first one June 16, 1981, didn't you? Yes. It's got Jimmy Ray Payne, death undetermined. That's correct. Now, would you go along with me in the medical profession that this is a solemn instrument, is it not? Yes. All right, now you got another report. Instead of undetermined, it's now homicide. That is correct. Yeah, but that was after the defendant, Wayne Williams, was indicted for the murder of Jimmy Ray Payne. I mean, you knew that, didn't you? Yes. Did you not tell Inspector Will Short of the Atlanta police that if it had not <clears throat> been for other killings, that in all probability you would have ruled Payne's death an accidental drowning? No, no, I don't believe I said that. Well, did you not tell an officer of the FBI that the death of Jimmy Ray Payne could well be that of drowning? Well, I didn't exclude drowning. Well, would you please answer yes or no? I can't just answer yes or no on a state... State yes or no! Well, it could be yes, as I said. Did you not tell Inspector Robbie Hamrick that, uh, in your opinion, the death of Jimmy Ray Payne could well be that of drowning, and that you based your opinion on the fact that the body was clad in what seemed to be red bathing-type shorts, and the signs of asphyxiation were not present. Again, it can't be within this context. Well, just answer yes or no whether you did or not. I don't remember. <laughs> Did you ever say to officers of the law that the height and weight of the victim was underestimated by someone and that you thought it was done diabolically? Yes. It was a suspicion I had. I told them Jimmy Payne was five foot six or seven. They put down five foot two. I feel that they put that down so he would seem smaller. Smaller and more like the other victims. Now, did it come to your attention that uh, Jimmy Ray Payne sold blood in this community rather frequently? No. 
No one told me he sold blood. Well, before. would you tell a jury, if a person sells blood frequently, that it reduces his blood level? It, it can cause anemia. And if he sells it frequently, would you go along with me to say that it would reduce his platelets and that he could hemorrhage easily? That's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, but it happens, don't it? Yes, it, it sometimes does. Dr. Zaki, do you know how Jimmy Ray Payne died? How he died? Yes! I have not been able to establish an exact mechanism for it. Thank you, Dr. Zaki. My name is David Rufus Stingle. Howdy. Hi, Chet Dellinger. Hi. He's employed by the National Weather Service. He's a service hydrologist. Would you tell Mr. Binder why you're here? I was called on to perform research specifically in relation to Jimmy Ray Payne. In what way? I made a study about the path of the body in the river and where it was found. Would you tell Mr. Binder what happened to your study? They changed it. Changed it. Jimmy Ray Payne was supposed to have been dropped off the right bank of the river and found on the left side. It was my job to find out how that could happen. And how could it have happened? There are only two ways that an object can move from one side of the river to the other. If it's carried by the currents or if there's some other external force moving it. Go on. I looked at the wind and the water currents and in neither case was there any evidence of any mechanism that would move an object from one side of the river to the other. What'd you find? I found that there was nothing in the wind or the currents that indicated that. That's what they wanted me to change. How do you feel about all this, Mr. Dangle? I don't feel that things are being dealt with squarely. Would you tell Mr. Binder what you asked permission to do? I wanted to construct a floating dummy of the approximate size and weight of Jimmy Ray Payne so that we could monitor how an actual human body would move in the river along the river bottom. What did they tell you? They said they didn't need me to do the research at this time and wouldn't give me any expenses for it. Supposing uh, we paid your expenses to make these tests. I don't know how it will come out. There's always the possibility that my research may end up being damaging to your case. Go ahead and make your experiments, Mr. Tingle. Sure, this approximates Payne's body. Uh-huh. We're using the water for weight. I was very careful to make sure the specific gravities were the same. I call him Ferdinand. Where'd you get him? From the phys ed department at the local college. They use him for first aid. Should we lower him in now? Yeah. Okay. Roll him over on face down. Okay. All right, now push him out. The floating dummy was released at the same point below the bridge on the right-hand side where Wayne Williams was supposed to have thrown Jimmy Ray Payne's body. Dingle tracked it as it moved downstream with the current. The first five times, the dummy only traveled a short distance before it hit a bend in the Chattahoochee on the right bank and was snagged and held by branches and debris underneath the surface. But Dingle released Ferdinand anyway and followed its path down to the point where Payne's body was found. Dingle would later testify that not once in the dozen times that Ferdinand was sent on his voyage did he ever end up on the left side of the bank where Payne's body was found. You want to stake that detail when Wayne Williams was arrested? Yes, sir. You were the first one that heard the splash? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with bodies hitting the water? Yes, sir, I am. Would you tell us how? 
I was a swimmer on my high school team for three years, and I've lifeguarded for three years. Would you tell us the sound you heard? Was that similar to anything that you've heard before? Very similar to a body hitting the water. Thank you. Now, would you agree with me that uh, along about 3 o'clock in the morning, it gets pretty dark outside? Yes, sir. I remember uh, I had a Boy Scout troop once. Do you have a Boy Scout? Yes, sir. We used to camp out a lot. Did you camp out a lot? Yes, sir. Yeah, when you wake up in the middle of the night, the slightest noise sounds loud, doesn't it? Yes, sir, when you wake up at night. Sure it does. Was it difficult for you to stay awake all the time? Frankly, I was totally uncomfortable down there with all the animals and the noises. I wasn't going to let any of them animals get to me. The first night I was there, a beaver got very close to me. Did it scare you? Oh, yes, sir. At the time, I didn't know it was a beaver. Hey, you just don't like meeting them in the dark, do you? I didn't like meeting anything in the dark under that bridge. How many did you see? Oh, 30 to 50. Oh. Well, the beavers always stay on the land or they uh, jump in the water now and then? Both. Now, you were... Uh, uh, up there on the bank, and you heard a splash. Would you tell the court and the jury whether or not the moon was shining? Do you remember? At the time, I don't believe it was. Well, where was your flashlight? Next to me. Did you shine it on the water after you heard the splash? Yes. See anything? No. Now, when you joined the police force, didn't they tell you there were times when policemen risked their lives for citizens? I guess so. Hey, you were a life guy. You have to take some tests. Did you qualify for that? Yes, sir. And they teach you how to save people from drowning, don't they? Yes, sir. And there are times when a man has got to take his life and expose it to danger, isn't there? Yes, sir. Now, tell this court and this jury, did you dive in the water and try to save the body you heard fall in the water that night? You didn't use the training you had to go in there and try to save that which you thought was a body in the river? No, sir. You just failed the Boy Scout test. Later in the trial, the defense introduced another recruit who had been on the bridge detail. Now, what, if anything unusual, did you ever hear Mr. Jacob saying on the radio? The most unusual thing we heard probably from anyone on all the bridges, was the ghost stories. Well, what did he say in that regard? He said he saw someone standing by the river's edge, and he thought that maybe they might be throwing a body into the river. And a SWAT team was called in to investigate down into the woods, and they uh, came back on the radio and said that he had only seen a ghost. What sorts of noises do beavers make at night, if you know? Uh, well, if uh, light has shined on them or they're scared, they make this uh, splashing noise with their tail on the water. I wonder if anything did Mr. Campbell ever tell you concerning Mr. Jacob's fear of the dark. Well, he said he was uh, afraid to even go out into the woods to urinate by himself. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever told, along with other recruits, that your status as a civilian employee rather than as a regular police officer might result in any kind of enrichment for you. Lieutenant Dick Weber told him, uh, you guys know you'll be able to collect a reward, don't you? And Campbell turned around and said, that's okay, I'm going to split it with everybody. <laughs> Under what circumstances was that information given to all the recruits? Uh, because of the fact that uh, the public was getting mad at the police department because they couldn't find the child murderer. Did you ever get assigned the job of going and collecting any type of animal here? Well, yes, sir. We were taken from the task force to go over to the Humane Society to check records for owners of specific types of dogs. Uh, what kind of dog here has they told you to collect, Mr. Lawson? Siberian Husky, uh, Afghan Hound, Russian Wolfhound, and uh, Malamute. Did they ask you to get any German Shepherd hairs? No. Do you know the type of person with regards to size and physical prowess the task force is looking for? We were told numerous times, you know, we were looking for an extremely large, strong person. Did they have any suspects that you knew of at the time? 
we had composite drawings of about 12 or 15. They were hanging on the wall there at the task force. Did any of them look like Wayne Williams? Well, no, sir. I don't uh, recall any of them even looking close to Wayne Williams. Do you know the defendant, Wayne Williams, on trial here today? Yes. Would you point him out? That's him. Now, I'd like to, if you will, refresh your memory and go back to the first time you had an occasion to see him. Would you tell us about that? Well, I was in this record store downtown, and I picked up this flyer. A young lady at work down there, she gave it to me. I uh, said this guy was in the music business. So I said, yeah, well, I'll give him a call, because I'm trying to sell some of my own music productions. As a result, did you meet Mr. Williams? Yes, I did. Now, did you have occasion to see Wayne Williams at the Atlanta studios? Yes, I did. Now, did you ever have any conversation with Mr. Williams that seemed strange to you? Well, I talked to him about the murders once. I said, what a shame it was that those children were getting killed now. Well, how did the conversation go? Well, I, I asked him, what did he think about it? You know, he just kind of said, point blank. I think they ought to keep the damned asses at home. Now, anything else occur with regard to a note? We were sitting down in the studio once, and he gave me this note. I think Carla Bailey uh, snatched it out of my hand and threw it away, or, or whatever. Tell us, as best you recall, what that note said and your reaction to it. We have Jack, Your Honor, unless he can produce it. His memory, Your Honor, he can testify as to what he recalls. He's subject to cross-examination. Okay. I'm going to let it in. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, what did that note say, so far as you recall? I could be a mayor. I could be a president. Or I could even be a killer. And what was Wayne Williams' reaction to your reading that note? I asked him, I said, who would do something like this? And he just started laughing. He started laughing. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. Did you know Nathaniel Cater? I did. When was the last time you saw him? It was the Friday before he disappeared, May 15th. Now, would you tell us about that? I was headed for another neighbor's house, and I saw Nat sitting on a bench in the park with another fella. What was Nathaniel doing in that neighborhood? He lived with his mother and father, and they lived a few blocks away from the park. Was there anybody with Nathaniel that day? Yes, there was. I remember quite well. Why do you remember him? The reason I noticed him was that he was a well-dressed man. And I had never seen that sitting with a man that was dressed like that. Well, what did they have on? Gray trousers and a gray long sleeve shirt. Did you notice any animals around? There was a dog, a German shepherd. Do you see the man in court that you saw on the park bench with Nathaniel Cater? Yes. Would you point him out? He's sitting between the lady and the man, right there, in the blue. She's with you. You know Wayne Williams before you saw him on TV? I didn't. Do you remember saying on a newscast you saw Wayne Williams with Nathaniel Cater on Memorial Day? three days after Wayne Williams was supposed to have thrown Nathaniel Cater off the bridge? No, I do not. Did you ever tell Miss Epstein that you saw Mr. Williams in a shirt with two hands printed on the material? Two hands hugging a woman's body. But you said it was a well-dressed man wearing gray trousers and a gray long sleeve shirt. Well, it's still the gray shirt that got the palm of the woman's hand hugging the body. <laughs> now, you said that... Uh, Mr. Cater lived with his mother and father when you last saw him. Yes. Now, little lady, didn't you know that Mrs. Cater died in 1973? Oh, I had no idea of that. But you said you knew him very well. Well, yes, I knew him well. Now, tell me about that dog. You, you like dogs? Yes, I have a dog. Oh, what kind do you got? 
I have a German Shepherd. You like that dog? I love him. Uh, was that other dog uh, pretty frisky? <laughs> Yeah, Frisky. He was a real playing dog. <laughs> playing dog. <laughs> Later in the trial, Binder introduced a most unusual witness. Your Honor, there's been a great deal of speculation about my next witness. There have been rumors that they have had to build an electric fence around the Williams home to protect people from it. He's been characterized by the newspapers and by witnesses, been ferocious, Frisky, and a dangerous ally, Mr. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, including members of the jury, I want everybody to be absolutely quiet during this demonstration. The dog in question is going to be brought into court, and we don't want to unnecessarily excite the dog. Proceed, Mr. Bynes. Let the uh, record reflect that the dog in question was brought into the courtroom. The jury has had an opportunity to <clears throat> observe the dog to determine whether or not the dog is frisky. <laughs> Miss Slayton, uh, how you think the trial's going? Well, how do you think it's going? We tend to think that your apprehensions about Mr. Binder, that he might make your witnesses not too smart, is happening. Well, I enjoy watching Mr. Binder work. He's a brilliant attorney. But still early in the trial, some of the fiber evidence, for instance, I believe the jury will find overwhelming. But now there's some feeling that uh, fiber evidence, without further corroboration, is uh, not sufficient to convict a man. If you excuse me, I better get back to my law books. As you can see, I, I have to do my homework to keep up with Mr. Binder. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry. No, that's all right. Come on in, Chuck. I'm a diabetic. My wife says to give me a shot or else all sorts of strange things happen to me. Well, I just want to tell you I think you're doing a terrific job. Thank you. Most important thing's coming up tomorrow, though. The fibers. Yeah, I know. More travesty of justice than true justice is perpetrated by trace evidence in a courtroom. Juries like it when a district attorney parades a lot of scientific paraphernalia in front of them. It gives a mental image of uh, white smock, stainless steel gloves, a glass of porcelain. And they put great credence in scientific showmanship. Yep. He had a heart attack last year, too. I'm not an invalid yet. Keep looking. The mother's in the courtroom and wondering what they're thinking. Do they think I'm trying to get the murder of their sons off? They keep looking at Wayne. Wonder what they're thinking about. Now, these fibers are taken from the green carpet found in Wayne Williams' bedroom. And ones that were taken from the bodies of Jimmy Payne and Nathaniel Cater. Can you explain? the shape of the green carpet fiber found in the Williams home. The appearance of this fiber shows a tri-lobal-like carpet fiber. It is uncommon because of the unusual design used by the Wellman Company. Uh, Miss Payson, uh, could you look over here, exhibit 638. Now, these represent two fibers which I recovered from the shorts of Jimmy Payne. Now, the bedspread that was found in the Williams house seem to be darker in appearance than the fibers which I recovered from the shorts of Jimmy Payne. I subjected the bedspread to a three-day period in water obtained from the Chattahoochee River and allowed it to sit on a windowsill to see if that might change the physical appearance of the fibers. There was a bleaching effect. Uh, what are these other fibers over here, sir? Uh, 637. Uh, now, these are eight other fibers that were found from Wayne Williams' environment on the bodies of the victims. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Would you take the stand again, please? Did you have occasion to make comparisons of the animal hair you recovered from Mr. Payne with the animal hair that you recovered from the Williams doll? Yes, I did. And what is your conclusion? I found that they were consistent 
based on your examination of the fibers and hairs found upon Jimmy Payne and Nathaniel Cater, and the comparison of the fibers and hairs found in the home of defendant Wayne Williams, do you have an opinion as to the significance of these comparisons? In my opinion, the combination of these fibers found on one or more of the victims make it almost impossible for them to have come from any environment other than Wayne Williams's. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. You may inquire. Do you have a list of the policemen that handled the bodies of Payton Cater before you examined it? I have no knowledge of... Yes or no? No, I have no such list. Have you determined uh, whether any of these people left fibers on the bodies of Payton Cater? Well, in my opinion, there would have had to have been a direct physical contact. When I ask you a the... question that provides for a yes or no answer, would you please answer? Now, have you determined that none of the people that handled the bodies contributed to the transfer of the fibers to the body of Payne or Cater, yes or no? No. Did you ascertain whether some of the fibers could have come from the debris of the river? I did examine a sample of water obtained from the charity which had a later date. I determined that there were none. At a later date? Would you tell the jury what that date was? September 14th. You know, I pretended to tell the jury that on September the 14th, the composition of the water was exactly the same as the day that the deceased body was found four months earlier, are you? I don't know what the difference may have been in the composition of the water. What was the total number of fibers you removed from Mr. Payne? I don't know the exact number. Hundred? Yes, hundred. Yeah. You looked at those fibers, and if you didn't find nothing that would match in a Williams home, you didn't look no further, did you? I compared the fibers. Answer, answer yes or no. Well, I don't believe I could answer that with a yes or no answer. What I am asking you as a scientist and an expert, just tell the jury, honestly, did you or did you not go any further? Yes, I did, consider them further. Oh. Go down to the homes of uh, Payne and Cater and see uh, if any of those fibers were the same types that uh, could be associated with a living environment? No. You go to the place where Payne and Cater hung out? Well, I have no personal knowledge of where Mr. Payne and Mr. Cater frequented, so... So, the answer is no, isn't it? That's correct. Get out of the Falcon Hotel and go in the room and do a search for dog hairs yourself? I did that myself, no. Can you specifically state that the uh, dog hairs were necessarily from the breed of a German Shepherd? Not specifically, no. Well, uh, prior to Wayne Williams coming to your knowledge, uh, you all were looking for a Malamute or a Husky dog hair, weren't you? I had made the uh, subjective evaluation to determine that a husky or a malamute may be involved. Yes or no? Yes. Now, isn't it the truth? When you found that dog down there at the Williams Hole, the malamute and the husky went out the window and the fibers on the body became that of a German shepherd. The hairs which I examined were consistent with that type breed, not to the exclusion of others. You can't tell much by a dog hair, can you? Now, those fibers from the shorts and uh, those you found from the bedspread as a scientist, chemist, or expert, those light fibers, they bothered you, didn't they? Couldn't get the match you were looking for, could you? When the comparison was first made against fibers, pulled directly from the bedspread is against the question fibers. The difference was significant in my mind, yes. And you started to experiment, and you never could get it the right color, could you? Well, I managed to get them very close, but not exactly the same. 
The answer is no. Would you tell the jury whether or not you made this observation? That as a science, forensics, the relatively new kid on the block, and you never know what a jury is going to do, but I'm optimistic about our case. Did you make that statement? Yes, sir. Now, when you make a statement like that about this case, aren't you departing from that detached house where the scientist lives and becoming a member of the prosecution team? No, sir. I don't think so. Al, I'm afraid that what we feared all along is going to happen. I have heard that they're going to try to introduce ten other cases with a justification of pattern. Other cases now? Yes, ma'am. I guess they can see their case against Williams isn't entirely substantial. So they want to introduce other murders to the trial with a justification that there was similar pattern in those cases. What is that? Well, if you can say the kids were bludgeoned, strangled, suffocated, stabbed, left on land in the water in the front of buildings, and in the woods as a pattern, there's pattern. Your Honor, may I approach the bench at this time? Yes, you may. Thank you. The state is prepared to present at this time in evidence of the murders which will tend to prove plan, scheme, pattern, bent to mind, and identity. Your Honor, the introduction of other murders would be so inflammatory that my client would not possibly receive a fair trial. Either they indict him for the murder they want to bring in, or they let it go. Under the authority of state, versus Johnson and various others, it is the obligation and responsibility to introduce Adam. And we'll hear argument. Thank you. Thank you. The jury may be excused. <coughs> Slate. Thank you. The first case where there is a pattern is the case of Alfred Evans. We are dealing with a victim, black, male, comes from a situation of poverty, a broken home, a street hustler, vulnerable to being picked up. There's no evidence of forced abduction. There is a method of body disposal which is quite unique. People apparently are killed and then dumped. There are fibers from the bedspread of the defendant, carpet fibers, dog hairs, various other fibers. Next case, Eric Middlebrooks, street hustler. Again, disappears and then he's found, dumped, laid out on his back. Pat Baltazar. Again, a street hustler. May it please the court, Your Honor. I don't think he should refer to these deceased as street hustlers. The only thing these poor children had in common was that they were poor. But if that is justification for pattern in America, the courts would be filled with requests like this. Overruled. Proceed. Lubigira. Young, black, poor family, street hustler, strangled, and you can say the same thing in these five other cases. That's Charles Stevens, Jojo Bell, Larry Rogers, John Porter, William Barrett, all murdered in the same way, all vulnerable to being picked up. No forced abduction. Unusual 
method of disposing the body, kill and dump. As in many cases, there are fibers in which there is a match. Thank you. Mr. Binder? Your Honor, Your Honor, there is no pattern here. Pattern would lead you to believe they all died the same way, but they didn't. Asphyxiation, strangulation by an object. You heard the doctor. Blunt trauma to the head, stab wounds. Where is the pattern? If there is a pattern, it is in the minds of those who indicted the defendant. Nowhere else. Slate. Connections run through these cases unmistakably. A pattern is obvious that it has caught the attention of the entire Western world. Oh, the Western world is obsessed with child murders. But the fact is, my client is charged with killing one man of 21 and another of 28. Your Honor, the public confidence depends on facts in a courtroom being developed within the rules of evidence. It is imperative that evidence be excluded, which may unduly prejudice the defendant based on uncharged crimes. Court will take this matter under submission. Where the hell you been? I've been looking all over the place for you. You all right? Chet, I'm whipped. They're gonna introduce pattern. I just heard. I really didn't believe they would. It wasn't enough. I had two murders against Wayne. I have so many documents and witnesses to interview that I haven't had time for. Now they want me to defend them against ten more murders. Now, look, my friend, you've already had one heart attack six months ago. Let's put this out and get you upstairs. Yeah. You go for this? Yeah. OK, let's go. Shit, yeah, I'm tired. I'll tell you something nice. Do you want to hear something nice? Yeah. I'll hear something. Parents are here again. Tell them I'm busy. Why won't you see us, Ben? Did you hear him in the courtroom? Did you hear what they're saying? They're calling our kids street hustlers. But Yusuf was nine years old when he died. What kind of street hustler comes from a nine-year-old child who was an honor student of his class, who was only out after dark if he was doing some errand for some old person who couldn't get out of the store? When a white kid go out and earn a dollar washing cars or, or running errands, that's just enterprise. But when one of our kids do the same thing, he ain't nothing but a low-down, dirty street hustler. Why do they have to lie about him? Look, people, you've come to the wrong place. Go to Slayton, go to Mayor Jackson, go to Lee Brown. I'm nothing here. I'm just an errand boy. They're the ones who run the city. If you've got a complaint, go to them. They won't talk to us. You know that. Every night I see my baby in my dreams. I had hoped that I would see some kind of meaning to their death, but there isn't going to be, is there? Look, I'm not God. I don't have a pipeline in Dwayne Williams' mind. Do you care that much about that damn badge? How much do you need that money? How much do you need that money? They're right. No better than the others. You're not the prosecutor, and you're not the judge. So what do they want from you? You know something? Walker said those same words to me. Murders never would have reached these proportions if people had stopped worrying about trying to protect their own positions. Well, what can you do? I can tell them about the witnesses that are coming up. Ben, you listen to me. I've seen you leave this house wet with fear to go out into the street into some scene where you could get the life blown out of you. I've seen you get up and answer a call when you were so tired that every inch of you ached. 
You can't lose everything you have. For what? What if he isn't guilty of the murders? You know and I know they're going to find Wayne Williams guilty no matter what you do or no matter what anybody does. They talk about Payne and Kate in that courtroom. You could be out and trying to sell blood tomorrow to pay for the grocery bills. That's how close we are to the edge. What are you doing? This is Ben. Meet me at the Three Deuces. Never mind what for, just meet me there. Who was that? That was Dellinger. What are you going to do? You're not going to tell him anything you shouldn't, are you? You're not going to put yourself in jeopardy. You're not going to put all of us in jeopardy, are you? Why this cloak and dagger meeting? You afraid me ain't seeing my company? I'm going to give you some information. Why? There are some things I think the defense should know. Is the case like that? Listen, Ben, if I were that disturbed about it, I'd tell everything I knew to the press and I'd resign. You wouldn't do that, though, would you? I'm not that big a fool. Why would that be being a fool? What impact would it have? Another cop's opinion? You resigned? How much good did it do? I resigned because I felt I had to. All right, now you're on the outside. This way, I at least have access to information. I can use the labs. I have some influence. Outside, I'm just another loner, like you. Scrounging around, trying to find whatever without resources that might have been available to me. Yeah, well, I've been the same thing all over again, so save the lecture. Just tell me why I'm here. I want to tell you about a witness named Daryl Davis. Another one who calls himself Cool Breeze. I'm listening. Another boy was found. His name was Leroy Millard James. He was 14. How long has he been gone? He left here about 4 or 30. All right, I'll go look for him. Don't worry. He just went to do an errand, and he disappeared. And somebody must know something. A young boy just doesn't drop off the face of the earth. Sorry. Is he turning it up, please? You have a great deal of Atlanta out there. They want to know your feelings. Thank you. I can't help wondering if they're working as hard as they would if it were a white child from a middle-class background. Would there have been a better chance of saving him? They've done something right away. I don't know. This is a place where black babies are hunted down and killed. Like animals. Thank you. 
There are kids being murdered all over the streets of Atlanta. But they don't matter because the department doesn't make any points if it solves their murders, does it? One more word like that, Mike, and I'm going to ask you for your badge. Jake. Go ask him back. I'd rather turn in my own badge. Jake, somebody's got to stop these crimes against children. Or there's no telling where it will end. And what are you saying to the police force? I am advising them, I am pleading with them to concentrate their efforts on this geographic pattern and to put stakeouts here, 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 and here in order to help prevent the next murder. It was the morning of Latonia Wilson's seventh birthday. As unbelievable as it may seem, somebody actually removed the window pane closest to the lock, reached through, opened the lock, then opened the door and stepped in. That person picked her out of her bed where she was sleeping next to her sister, then walked past her brother, who was sleeping in the next bed, and took her out of the house. You want us to make a statement that there's a Jack the Ripper killing the poor black children of Atlanta? But I don't believe that. We got ourselves a black mayor. We got ourselves a black commissioner of public safety, black councilman. We got everything black from top to bottom. We got everything but protection for our black children. If you want to kill off a race, the first thing you must do is kill the seed. Right, yeah. Now, the whole thing here in Atlanta is the first step in a plan toward genocide. No, no. no. They didn't my baby. They didn't stop my baby. Papa didn't disappear. It's a green carpet fiber. It's very unusual because a cross-section of the fiber shows a trilobular design with one short leg. Trilobular. Yeah. On June 28, 1979, Dr. Nathan Sack of Columbus, Ohio, a well-known surgeon and his wife, had come to Atlanta for the annual convention of the Association of Nuclear Medicine. They were to be part of Atlanta's 131st homicide of 1979. Give me your handbag. <laughs> Hurry up. Dr. Sack's murder was on the front page of the Atlanta daily newspapers and prominent in newspapers all over the country. But a short time later, a crime happened that barely was mentioned in one of Atlanta's newspapers. In all likelihood, the boy was already dead when he was brought to this spot. He was 14 years old. The second boy was last seen on his way to a skating rink. He too was 14 years old. This was the beginning of a case that was to be one of the most baffling in the crime annals of the United States. And before the ordeal had ended, a city would go crazy. And no one who touched the case in any way would ever be the same again. The Atlanta child murders had begun. Do you realize the increase in homicides this year? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't, but I'm quite sure you do. We have had 231 homicides, a 61% increase over 1978. I hope you realize that when you print stories like that, how much you hurt Atlanta. One of our main sources of revenue is the convention trade. The city is 66% black, and we are going to have a proportionate number of black officers. Yeah. 
Instead of bring a bucket They throw in the pail If you don't get my letter Then you'll know that I'm in jail What becomes of all the little boys Who never say their prayers Sleeping like a baby On the nickel over there mm -hmm. Well, I'll still settle for fingerprints, motive Old-fashioned things like that. What do you want to bet when we find the murderer? He's got a green carpet in his house. The eight-year-old boy has been identified by dental records as Christopher Richardson, son of Selena Cobb, who lives at 3624 Martin Luther I'm so sorry, Miss Cobb. Could you tell us how you feel? Get out! Get out! You don't have no more heart! and the contraption you brought in here. What's your name? Now we're at mine and mine. We're just trying to show the people what's happening. Get out! Get out of my house! Come on, get out of here! 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 Get out bodies were being dumped into the river. The body was clad in red bathing type shorts. Could have been drowning. But I think we have to mark this uh, mechanism unknown. What am I charged with, man? You're a suspect in the case of the missing and murdered children, Chip. You guys are so desperate for a suspect that it's affecting your faculties. And if I wasn't a veteran of 18 years on the police force, I'd be scared as hell right now, because I know how easily a case can be made to work if there's a need for it. Look, I'm just warning you, Chip. You just stay out of our way. Get on out the case. We had staked out bridges in DeKalb, Fulton, and Cobb counties. I heard a splash. A loud splash. Is there a car on the bridge? I can't see it from where I'm at. That splash was to change the course of the Atlanta murders 